In this session, I'll discuss the particle physics and accelerator. This is the last topic. Uh, I'll discuss the structure question related to this topic. So in question one, a stationary anti-neutron decay by emitting a positron. Explain how energy is conserved in this decay. So we have a stationary anti-neutron is there. And it is emitting out positron. So how we can say the energy is conserved? First, an anti-neutron is there, which is stationary. But then it emits out a positron. A positron is emitted out. So when it releases positron, what will happen? Positron is anti-particle like electron is there. Anti-particle if electron is called positron. So anti-electron is also known as a positron. So how we can say the energy is conserved here? Basically, when the neutron is stationary, the kinetic energy of the neutron is zero because it is not moving at all. But when it produces a positron, so the mass, because neutron is having, neutron or anti-neutron is having a high mass, but electron or positron, they are lighter. So the mass will be smaller. So from what will happen, how it will get the energy? Because initially the sum of kinetic or sum of energy plus the mass before any interaction should be equal to sum of energy and mass after the interaction. So in the beginning, the neutron was stationary. Neutron was not moving at all. So kinetic energy was zero. All it was having a mass. But when this neutron When this neutron breaks into or give out positron, because positron is lighter, so the mass is smaller. So as a result, if the mass is smaller, what will happen to the inner, the remaining mass? That mass is actually converted into energy. So the points which you will include. So first thing when we'll mention, we'll mention like neutron or anti-neutron is producing a positron, it means the mass of the product is smaller than the mass of the reactant. And what happened to the remaining mass? That remaining mass is converted into energy. So the points you will include here that the mass of product is smaller compared to the reactant. And what happened? How the uh, particle get this energy? So the mass difference provide kinetic energy to positron. Then in question two, the equation shows the decay of anti-neutron, uh, anti-neutron decay into proton, positron or anti-electron and electron neutrino. Explain how this equation so that decay obeys three conservation laws. So we have to check the conservation of the charge. First thing we'll check the conservation of the charge, then we'll check the conservation of baryon number, and then we'll check the conservation of lepton number. So first, when we check the conservation of the charge, Neutron does not have any charge, so that is zero. Proton is having a charge. Proton is like one point plus 1.6 experiment minus 19 or relative charge we can write here. That is plus one. 
and this is but anti protons if the proton is positive particle anti proton will be negative so this will be minus 1 the charge of electron is minus relative charge is minus 1 but positron will be plus 1 because it is anti particle anti particles have different spins as well as the charge an electron neutrino is a neutral particle so does not have any charge so means the charge is conserved so first we'll check the conservation of the charge it is same for both sides then what we can check we can check a baryon number baryon number for each quark if a particle is a quark the baryon number is 1 by 3 and anti quark it is minus 1 by 3 because neutron consists of three quarks so neutron consists of the baryon number for a neutron is plus 1 but this is anti neutron so the baryon number will be minus 1 so that is baryon number is minus 1 baryon number for every proton it is plus 1 but because this is anti proton so this will be minus 1 and electron neutrinos and positrons these are leptons and leptons does not have any baryon number so baryon number is 0 so this is also the baryon number is also conserved then we will we'll check the lepton number lepton number for each electron it is plus 1 and anti electron is minus 1 and same thing electron neutrino is plus 1 and anti electron neutrino is minus 1 so when we check the lepton number uh, neutron is a baryon so its lepton number is 0 proton is also a baryon so lepton number 0 anti electron neutrino like a uh, and positron is there so lepton number will be minus 1 and electron neutrino will be there lepton number is plus 1 so this is conserved in terms of lepton number so we check the conservation of the charge then we check the conservation even we can check the conservation of the mass as well the mass will be conserved charge baryon number or in lepton numbers as well so about the baryon number lepton number you have to memorize for each particle and anti particle In question two, mesons are produced by a cosmic rays in the Earth's upper atmosphere. In 1940, the observation is there for decays of the muon, and muons were traveling at a speed about 0.994 speed of light. And Rossi Hell found 74 percent of the uh, muon detected at 1,600 meter reached the bottom of the mountain. The average lifetime of Muon is about two point two exponent minus six second. So they suggested that their observation could explain using idea from relativity. So explain whether these observations are consistent with the idea from the relativity. What is the concept of the relativity? Relativity is like when object travel close to speed of the light, they gain the mass or the speed. Their mass increases. so that's why you will find a common term that is about rest mass rest mass means like the mass when the particles are stationary and what is a relative mass relativistic mass not relative mass relativistic mass relativistic mass is when the particles are moving close to speed of light their mass does not remain constant the mass increases that we called as a relativistic mass So Rossi and Hall made observation of the decay of these muons, and they they measured the number of the muons reaching the bottom of the mountain and the number of the positron uh, and reaching a position, sorry, about one thousand six hundred meter higher up the mountain. So what will happen as the muons will travel closer to speed of the light? Like about point nine nine four c means it is like a speed of a light closer to speed of light. So as it is closer to speed of the light, what will happen? The mass will increase. And as a result, when the mass will increase, the particle will take longer time to decay. That's why most of the particle can reach the. bottom of the mountain so here like muons are produced by cosmic rays and in 1940 rossian hall made observation of the decay of the muons 
they measure the number of muon reaching the uh, bottom of the mountain. So, like there's a mountain, how many muons are reaching at the bottom of mountain? Reaching uh, up position 16, 1600 high of the mountain. So, they were comparing like one, this height is about 1600 meter. Like how many muons are there at the top and how many muons reach the bottom of the mountain. And these muons are traveling at a speed of 0 0.994 speed of a light. And they found that 74% of the muon detected at 1,600 meter reaches the bottom. And the average lifetime of a muon is about 2.2 exponent minus 6. Like this is the time the muon will take to decay. After this time, the muon will decay as muons are consist of quarks and antiquarks. So, suggest that their observation could be explained using idea from relativity. So, how we can explain this idea of relativity? First thing, that the muons are moving closer to speed of the light, so the mass will not be constant, the mass will increase. So, first point, the muon moving closer to the speed of light, the mass of the muons will increase. And as a result, the mass will increase, the decay time will also increase. Like they will take relatively longer time to decay. And when we work out how much time they will take to cover this distance, like this mountain is example, 1,600 meter, and these muons are moving at a speed 0.994 C. So speed is equals to distance divided by time. So time is equals to distance divided by speed. So distance which they cover, that is 1,600 meter. And the speed, which is 0.994, into 3 into the power 8. When we simplify this, this will give us the time it will take for decay. So 1600 divided by 0 0.994 into 3 exponent 8. Five point three exponent minus six. Okay, so this will be five point three into ten to the power minus six second. So they 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 have to take like they will take about five point three into ten to the power minus six seconds. And when the particle move closer to this, and practically the decay time, like normally for a muon, what is the decay time that is given, which is about two point two exponent minus six. So 2.2 into 10 to the power minus 6 seconds, the muon can decay in this time. So what we'll do, we'll find if they, they take 2.2 exponent minus 6, how much distance it can cover. So distance will be speed multiplied by time if they're moving with the same speed. So 0 0.994 into 10 to the power, uh, into 3 into 10 to the power 8 multiplied by their decay time, 2.2 into 10 to the power minus 6 seconds. So how much distance they can cover? What's the answer for this? 0.994 into 3 exponent 8 into 2.2 exponent minus 6. This will give us how much distance they can cover. So that is 656. So if they were having a normal decay time, 2.2 exponent minus 6, they will only cover 656 meters. They are not, the muons like after covering 656 meter, the muons will disappear because Muons have a short, are, are particles with a short life that these particles are not very stable. They, they disappear and form or give out energy. So if uh, it means that there is a relativistic effect, relate, whenever relativistic effect is there, it means that as the muons are moving closer to speed of the light, the mass of the muon increases. 
and as the mass increases so they will take longer time to decay as they will take longer time to decay they can reach the bottom of the mountain so this is also an evidence that when the particle move closer to speed of the light they don't have the constant decay time or their mass is not constant the mass also increases after muon were discovered in 1936 there were known uh, there were known for many years as mu mesons explain why mu muons are not described as me like explain why muons are not described as mesons in the standard model so what is the reason for that why muons are not described as a mesons in the standard model because what are muons muons are left because in a standard model the particles are divided into two categories one is known as a quark family another one is known as a lepton family so muons are actually leptons and muons are the fundamental or the elementary particle the basic particles are there but mesons are made up of quarks because lepton the in a standard model there are only 12 fundamental particles which uh, which are divided into two categories quarks and leptons quarks can be up down top bottom charm and strange and leptons can be electron electron neutrino muon muon neutrino and tau and tau neutrino these are the standard particles any particle other than this is not the standard particle so standard model we have either a quark family or a lepton family so they are saying after muons were discovered in 1936 they were known for many years as mu mesons explain why muons are not described as a mesons in a standard because muons are what muons are fundamental particles fundamental particle means every particle like they cannot be further divided till now so they are fundamental particles and fundamental particles can be lepton or a quark why they are not described as a meson because what is the meaning of a meson meson means it consists of the particle and antiparticle so when particle and antiparticle combine we call them as a mesons but muons are not Uh, they are the basic particle it consists of only one type of particle that's why they are not categorized as meson in the standard model in question 3 in 1937 scientists in university of california use a high speed particles from a cyclotron to produce isotope of phosphorus this isotope can be used in treatment of the cancer so what is the concept here this is a cyclotron we produce a particle then we deflect by magnetic field then accelerate then deflect then accelerate deflect until it reaches a certain speed and it will come out at a high speed as a result when it will move at a high speed it can collide with other particles and produce other massive particles explain the role of electric and magnetic fields in the production of high speed charged particles in a cyclotron what is the use or the purpose of electric field electric field is mainly used to accelerate the particle or increase the kinetic energy of the particle and here we apply alternating potential so that we can accelerate between the d's so particle is only accelerated here like between the d's this part it will accelerate same thing here the particle will only accelerate in this part and there is always a alternative terminal like when the particle is moving from one d to another like these are the two d's if the particle is moving the particle start we use a magnetic field to deflect then say positive negative so particle will accelerate here 
when particle enter and deflect again, then there will be again opposite terminal. So it will accelerate. So every time it will receive the same like polarity or same terminal of the battery so that it will accelerate between the Ds and it will deflect. Eventually it will come out from the D. So here electric field is used to accelerate the particle and increase the kinetic energy. So we can use the electric field to accelerate the particle or we can use it to increase its kinetic energy of the particle by applying alternating voltage. Then what is the purpose of a magnetic field? The magnetic field is used to deflect the particle. A magnetic field is per applied perpendicular to the motion so that it can deflect the particle and particle can undergo a circular motion. So in a small space, we can move the particle to a greater uh, speed. So magnetic field is applied perpendicular because if you apply parallel, it won't experience the force. The magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the particle which rotate the particle And as a result, the particle can be accelerated to higher speed in a short space. So this is always the case, use of electric and magnetic field in a cyclotron. In second part, the cyclotron could produce a beam of alpha particle with a kinetic energy up to 16 mega electron volt. Calculate the magnetic flux density which is required by the cyclotron when alpha particle with a kinetic energy of 16 mega electron volt are produced. The diameter of a cyclotron is 0.94 meter and mass of alpha particle is 6.6 .6 into 10 power minus 27 kilogram. So first, using the kinetic energy there's a relation like when particles are accelerated using a kinetic energy, like using the electrical energy, we accelerate the particle. So, and there's a relation between the circular motion and the magnetic field. Like here, when particles are accelerating, the kinetic energy is due to electrical Ke is equal to electrical energy. And when object is moving in a circular path, we can say centripetal force is equal to magnetic force. If you are using a magnetic field to rotate the particle uh, in a or move the particle in a circular path. And here we have mv square over r is equals to qvb. So we will cancel with square. So it is mv over r is equals to qb. So this is a formula which we can use to work out as we want to calculate the magnetic flux density. So we need B. Where M is the mass of the particle, which we have. R is the radius of the curve path. That, that will also be there because if we know the diameter, we can have radius. Then what we need, we need the speed. So how to work out the speed? As we assume the kinetic electrical energy is used to accelerate. So electrical energy will be equal to kinetic energy. Or there's also another formula which relate the kinetic energy with the momentum that Ke is equals to 
because kinetic energy is half mv square. If I multiply, divide this equation by m, so it will be half m square v square over m. So the formula in that case, ke will be equal to p square over 2m. We can also use this formula uh, to get the momentum and from momentum we can find the speed. But any one of the formula you can use. So kinetic energy is equal to electrical energy. But the kinetic energy is mega electron volt. Electron volt is not the SI unit. So you have to convert this mega electron volt first into joules. So first we'll convert this mega electron volts into joules. So 16 mega electron volt, first we'll convert into electron volt. Mega means 10 power 6, so it will be 16 into 10 power 6 electron volt. Then electron volt, we want to convert into joules. So one electron volt equals to 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 joules. So if we have 16 into 10 power 6 electron volt, this will be x joules. We cross multiply. So electron volt we convert into joule by multiplying with 1.6 into 10 power minus 19. So the energy, what we'll get, this is 16 into 10 power 6 times 1.6 into 10 power minus 19. That answer will be in joules. After getting this answer in joules, use the formula kinetic energy is half mv square. So kinetic energy we have now, mass of the alpha particle is already given. So we will work out the speed. 2.56 exponent minus 12, okay. So this will be 2.56 into 10 power minus 12, joules will be there. Then it will be one by two, m is the mass, which is 6.6 .6 into 10 power minus 27. And v square. So this two will be multiplied 6.6 .6 exponent minus 27, then take a root. After taking a root, you will get the value for speed. And then we have the original formula mv over r is equals to qb. So we need the b. So it will be mv divided by rq is equals to b. m is there. That's already given. v, we already worked out. r is the radius, which we can find from its diameter. Diameter divided by two will get the radius. And Q is the charge of alpha particle. Alpha particle consists of two proton and two neutron. So the charge of alpha particle will be two into 1.6 exponent minus 19. That is the charge. So we'll have Q, R, V, M. So just substitution and we'll get the value for V. Is it uh, clear? In question four, a section from a periodic table is shown. So technetium, which is Tc produced when deuterium ion collide with a nucleus of one of the other elements shown in the table. In this process, number of neutron are also released. The deuterium is an isotope of a hydrogen, which is having one proton and one neutron. Complete the nuclear equation to determine the element and the number of the neutron which are released. So how we can work out this? Because uh, the mass should be conserved, the proton number should also be conserved here. Hy for hydrogen, one proton, and nucleon number is the sum of neutron and proton. So this should be two because one proton and one neutron. So one plus one, it will be two. So total on this side, nine, nine plus two, so 98. So here we have five. So how many should be there? Because on the left-hand side, it is 98. So right-hand side should also be 90, 98. So that's why we put three here because 9 plus 2, 98 on the left, and 95 plus 3, 98 on the right. Then at the bottom also, neutron does not have any proton number, so that is 0. So on the right-hand side, it is 43. 
So on the left hand side should also be 43. If one is here, this should be 42. So which element is 42 MO? That is 42. So this is the complete equation. And how many new, I, because one neutron for each neutron, it is one here. So how many neutrons should be released? Three neutrons should be released. Because 96 plus 2, 98, and this is 95. So each neutron is one here. So how many neutrons should be released? Three neutrons should be released. So the sum will be 98. So this is a full equation. In question five, the following passage is taken from article about the history of the particle physics. Mystery particle. In 1932, scientists knew the existence of subatomic particle, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. These were believed to be a fundamental. As you have studied, like when you were there in class seven or eight, you have studied the Dalton atomic theory, and there it was written that atom is an indivisible particle. So that time atom was considered as a fundamental particle. But after the discovery of neutron, proton, and electron, they considered that neutron, proton, and electron are the fundamental particles, were the fundamental. But then in 1936, scientists were using a track of cosmic rays to identify a predicted particle known as mesons. Instead, another particle was discovered. So actually, they were checking the track of a meson, and from meson, they identified another particle, meon. And this was so sur surprising that the Nobel Prize winning physicist. So, describe how the underlying particle fit into the standard model. So, how this particle meon can fit meon and mesons are fit into the standard model. And here we have electron is there, proton is there, neutron. These are the underlying particles. So first, just you have to write the statement about this particle. First, electron. So what is electron? Electron is a fundamental particle. And it's also a first generation particle. First generation particle means the particle which was discovered early are known as a first generation particle. The particle discovered after like uh, mid 1940s, 1930s are known as the second generation particles. So first we have electron. You just have to write the description of each of them, how it fit into standard model. Electron is a fundamental particle. And it belongs to lepton family in the standard model because standard model divide the particle into families lepton and quarks. So it, Electron is a fundamental particle and it belongs to lepton family. Then what about neutron? Neutron is not the fundamental particle. Neutron is actually a baryon which consists of three quarks. Baryon means the particle consists of quarks. Quarks are fundamental, but neutron and uh, elect neutron and protons are not fundamental. Then we have uh, proton, the same description. It is not the fundamental particle. It's a baryon and consists of three quarks. And quarks particles are fundamental. Then we have mesons. Mesons are not fundamental as well. They are consisting of quark and antiquark. 
like one quark is there and another anti quark is there and the last one is muon muons are fundamental particle they are leptons which experience the strong nuclear force uh, weak nuclear force the uh, quarks experience the strong nuclear force so just the point which you have to mention neutron protons are baryons baryon means which consist of three quarks meson uh, is not a fundamental it is a combination of quark and anti quark electron and neutrons are leptons or you can also mention neutron proton and electron are first generation where muon is a second generation particle and leptons electrons muon quarks these are fundamental where proton neutron are not fundamental then another question in 1908 rutherford giger and marsden investigate the interaction of alpha particle with matter in one set of experiment they directed the alpha particle towards a thin gold foil a state in why alpha particle uh, state why the alpha part alpha source in a gold foil were contained in a vacuum so why we have a vacuum because if the if there was no vacuum then the particle may collide with the air molecules and they might lose their energy so we want so air does not stop the alpha particle that's why there is a vacuum so why we create a vacuum so the air particles does not so the air particle does not stop them 